So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, lovely to see such a, a great turnout for this evening's uh, lecture. I'm uh, David Uderberg, I'm head of the philosophy department, so I'm here just <coughs> to chair and to introduce our, our, uh, our speaker for this evening. So, um, this is, as you can tell, the annual Coddingham lecture. Um, where is John? Where's John? There you are. So, <laughs> the, uh, so, so just a little bit of background, so the annual Cottingham Lecture, named after our former head of department, former head of everything in the philosophy department, uh, John Cottingham, uh, was set up uh, a couple of years ago uh, in honour of John and his many varied uh, and long-standing contributions to the philosophy department at the University of Reading. And uh, our, our, so we were originally going to have the inaugural in 2020, COVID of course, stymied that and then we had our inaugural lecture last year which was Sir Anthony Kenny and that was online. Today the second uh, lecture, Cottingham lecture, is fantastically in 3D with people in the same physical space which is a wonderful <laughs> thing to behold um, and uh, we have an equally esteemed and, and uh, speaker, <coughs> a long-standing friend of the department, Dr Peter Hacker, I'm sure many of you will know uh, of, of Peter through his works. I've read his many and varied um, books on so many subjects. Uh, so Peter's an emeritus research fellow at St. John's College, Oxford, where he taught for many years um, as tutor in philosophy. And Peter's also an honorary fellow of the Queen's College, Oxford, and of St. Anthony's College, Oxford. No. Is that right? Not of St. Anthony's no, College, no. only of the Queen's College, Oxford. That's right. Um, and uh, among Peter's many achievements and positions is simply he, he, he's famous for his work on philosophy of Wittgenstein, uh, on which he's written numerous books that will be familiar to, to many of us here, um, and books on many other subjects, um, most notably in recent years, the philosophical foundations of neuroscience and issues in sort of cognitive science and a magisterial series on human nature, uh, which um, some of you will know, which I, uh, for one, greatly admire. Um, and uh, just Peter has enormous wide ranging interest that is always a delight to listen to. Uh, so it's wonderful to have him as our second uh, annual Cotting um, lecturer. Just to say that um, the lecture will be record is being recorded. Um, uh, it's not being live streamed. Um, so Great that everyone's here in person, uh, but it is being recorded. It will go up on our YouTube channel at some later stage. I can't tell you when, um, but you may want to keep an eye out for that. We have a YouTube channel. Just I'm doing all the obligatory social media stuff that we're supposed to do these days. Our website, our Facebook, our Twitter. Um, so uh, if you do want to follow up the activities in the department, not least this particular event, do please have a look at those. Um, the uh, title of uh, Peter's lecture today is Other Minds, Other People and Human Capacity and then we'll have hopefully time after Peter's talk for a little bit of Q&A as well. So uh, without further ado, thank you so much Peter for, for, for coming down to Oxford to speak to us today. Look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. It, it, it is a, a, a great honour for me to be able to pay tribute to John Cottingham and the wonderful things he's done both for the Department of Philosophy at Reading University but also for the enormous contribution he has made to philosophy, both the study of Descartes, which is second to none, and uh, his investigations in philosophy of theology and in axiology, from which I've learned so much. I'm also honoured to be able to follow in the, footsteps of, in the footsteps of Tony Kenny, who was John's tutor and my mentor. I hope I can live up to his standards. It's a striking fact that the puzzles about the existence of knowledge of, an, of other minds did not occur to the ancients. Neither the academic skeptics nor the Pyrrhonians were concerned with skepticism regarding the existence of other minds. Solipsism was not an issue and there is no indication that they felt driven by their philosophical commitments into a solipsistic position. It's nevertheless surprising that there are no skeptical doubts expressed about our knowledge of other minds, no challenge to the possibility of knowing the character of the experiences, thoughts, feelings and will of other people. For one might have expected the expression of the skeptical view that only belief about how things are with others is attainable. But this too is not mooted. 
Ancient skepticism takes for granted that there are other people and that they have sensible experiences. It focuses attention upon the differences in the sense impressions and judgments of others concerning the material world in order to show that knowledge of the material world is not attainable, but only opinion. For things appear differently to the sober and to the intoxicated, to the old and to the young, to the attentive and to the inattentive. Appearances vary according to observation conditions. Candlelight is bright in the dark but dim in sunlight. The shapes of things are indistinct from afar but clear from proximity. So we must learn to live with scepticism about how things are and not pretend to know things which outstrip our fallible faculties and our condition in the world. Only thus, according to the Pyrrhonians, can we achieve a life of tranquility. The great exception to this was Augustine. In De Trinitate, he wrote that although we can see the movements of other living bodies like ourselves, we cannot see their minds. Rather, we infer that they have minds and infer what passes in their minds by similarity to our own case. The position adopted by Augustine is what Wittgenstein was later to characterize as semi-solipsism, and which he strove to show to be incoherent. Why semi-solipsism? Because although this argument doesn't presuppose or assert that I am non-contingently the only subject of experience, which is the ontic doctrine of solipsism, I am the vessel of life, as Wittgenstein once put it, it holds that I know that I have a mind and know what a mind is, quite independently of whether there are any minds other than my own. I know what a mind is simply by apprehending my own mind. And so Augustine writes, but when it is said to the mind, know thyself, then it knows itself by the very act by which it understands the word thyself, and this for no reason than that it is present to itself. One knows one's mind directly, for one's mind is self-presenting, unmediated by evidence. This semi-solipsism immediately presents knowledge of the existence and experience of other minds as problematic. For other minds are not observable. One can't see the minds of others. All we can observe are externalities, the body and the movements of the body. So how can we know that there are any minds other than our own? To this, Augustine offers an analogical argument. Indeed, he appears to be the first to have done so. I've dwelt on Augustine not because his semi-solicism was so influential, it, it wasn't, nor was the analogical argument that he advanced. Augustine's ideas are important because the problem of other minds haunts early modern philosophy and bedevils modern philosophy. Most importantly, it is the bane of contemporary cognitive neuroscience and experimental psychology. Since philosophy trickles down into popular intellectual circles, and since popularized cognitive neuroscience is currently all the rage, it's commonplace to encounter speakers on radio and television, as well as journalists, who aver without hesitation, one can't ever really know what other people are thinking, or one can't really know the feelings of others. I shall try to show that this is a sore confusion. Moreover, it is a confusion that masks important truths about our knowledge and understanding of other people and of the human condition. <clears throat> the existence and knowledge of the contents of other minds became problematic as soon as the distinction between primary and secondary qualities was drawn. The first to draw the distinction was Galileo, although the terminology is not his but Robert Boyle's. The primary qualities, according to Galileo, are common sensibles apprehended by sight and touch. They're objective geometric qualities of properties and subject to mathematicization. The secondary qualities are proper sensibles and are nothing in the external bodies themselves, but are merely the effect on us of the impact of particles on our senses. We're prone to ascribe them to bodies in the world on the grounds of our senses, not of reason. But reason, from Galileo's thoroughly Platonist perspective, is our sole reliable guide to truth. In us, sensible qualities of color, sound, smell, taste, and sensations of heat or cold are mere sensory ideas, and they don't represent anything in the bodies themselves. So we are locked within a veil of ideas. All philosophers and scientists who accepted the distinction between primary and secondary qualities held that we perceive whatever we perceive through the medium of ideas. 
Consequently, knowledge of objects in the physical world is problematic. Knowledge of the existence of other subjects of experience is even more problematic, since although we may receive ideas of the bodies of others, we can have no idea of the minds of others. Other minds are, so to speak, beyond the pale. Even more problematic is the possibility of penetrating the minds of others to learn what ideas they have, what experiences they are enjoying, what thoughts and feelings occupy their minds. Different philosophers reacted differently, both to the question of whether we can know that there are other minds and to the question of whether we can achieve knowledge of the thoughts and experiences of others. Descartes held that animal life is a purely mechanical affair, but possession of a mind or consciousness is not. Accordingly, he held that we know that other human beings are not mere mechanical machines from their use of language to express their thoughts. For the formation of thoughts and their expression in dispassionate assertions is non-mechanical. That incidentally is why Chomsky, despite his book Cartesian Linguistics, is actually an anti-Cartesian linguist because he believes that the formation of thoughts and sentences is wholly mechanical. <laughs> Locke, simply dis Locke, Locke simply disregarded the problem of other minds, although his confusions are manifest in his remarks on the inverted spectrum problem. To know what ideas are in another man's mind, he claimed incoherently, we would have to, I quote, pass into another man's body to perceive what appearances were produced by those organs, their eyes. Given his belief that we're locked behind a veil of ideas, it is indeed difficult to see how he could have given a coherent account of our knowledge of the thoughts and experiences of other people. Antoine Arnaud, on the other hand, unencumbered by the veil of ideas, did confront the problems and he explicitly invoked an analogical argument as the warrant for belief in the existence and contents of other minds. It's striking that Berkeley attempted to invoke an analogical argument, but this, as Thomas Reed hastened to point out, was radically incoherent given Berkeley's repudiation of the mind-independent existence of the material world. An analogical argument cannot intelligibly be advanced by an idealist. The ideas of other human beings excited in our minds are caused not by the bodies of others, but by God. The only mind that informs them is God's. In Berkeley's system, one might say, there is room only for tea for two. Amidst all this confusion, a modicum of consensus emerged. We know directly and immediately what experiences and thoughts we ourselves have simply by having them. How do we know? Well, by consciousness, according to Descartes, by internal sense or perception of our perceptions, according to Locke, by apperception, according to Leibniz, by transcendental synthesis, according to Kant, or in the 19th century, by introspection, according to William James. What then of other minds? Here too, there was a degree of consensus. Firstly, we do know, at any rate with moral certainty, that there are other minds, and secondly, we can't achieve knowledge of what another mind is experiencing, perceiving, thinking, feeling, or desiring. The most we can achieve is opinion, according to Locke, analogical conjecture, according to Arnaud, probable knowledge, according to Berkeley, and in the 19th century, analogical induction, according to Mill. Let me pause to draw your attention to something truly remarkable. This consensus is jejune. It's an absurd misrepresentation of the human condition and a misuse of the verbs to know, to opine, and to conjecture. If someone has suffered a terrible accident and is writhing in agony in the, on the ground in a pool of blood, it's no conjecture nor mere opinion that he's in agony. This is a paradigm example of knowledge. When Romeo avows his passionate love for Juliet, it would be risable to assert that she conjectures that he's fallen in love with her. When Kant articulates his ideas on perpetual peace, which are singularly lucid, it would be absurd to claim that we don't know what he thought on the subject. Mill, in an examination of Sir William Hamilton's philosophy in 1865, purported to give an analogical argument for the existence of other minds and for the knowledge of the experience of others. 
He held that the so-called external world and the objects within it are permanent possibilities of sensation or sense experience. He didn't grasp that this makes no sense if material objects are not given. One may intelligibly hold that material objects present permanent possibilities of sense experience for those who possess sense organs with appropriate sense faculties. But to speak of possibilities of perception independently of the existence of any actualities to perceive, and, sorry, any actualities to perceive and material objects to perceive them, sorry, I'll read that again. But to perceive possibilities of perception independently of the existence of any actualities to perceive and material beings to perceive them makes no sense. It's within this incoherent phenomenalist framework that Mill advances an analogical argument for the existence of other minds. He contended that whereas the material world consists of no more than permanent possibilities of sensation, the existence of which cannot be proved, the existence of other minds can be proved by analogy. The argument from analogy sits uncomfortably within Mill's phenomenalist framework, albeit for reasons somewhat different from Berkeley's similar predicament within his idealist framework. Mill piles incoherence upon incoherence when he claims that the frequent exemplification of the analogy between the behavior of others and my own behavior elevates the argument to an inductive confirmation. But the multiple instantiation of an analogy cannot constitute inductive confirmation, since for there to be inductive correlations, both items in the correlation must be independently identifiable in experience. Had Mill possessed the concept of a logical construction, he might have mentioned the claim that other human beings are logical constructions out of my sense data, and that other minds are second-order logical constructions out of the behavior of other human beings. And strikingly, this was precisely what was argued by Rudolf Carnap in his book, The Logical Structure of the World, in 1928. He argued that other human beings and their behavior, which he called, rather horribly, a heteropsychological, are second-order logical constructions out of my experiences, the autopsychological. What is given is no more than the basis of the Cartesian, sorry, what is given is no more than the basis of the Carnapian construction, namely unowned psychological data. The constructional basis for the logical empiricist enterprise was optional, according to Carnap. Carnap chose unowned sense data and characterized his technique as methodological solipsism. But he wrote he could just as well have chosen a physicalist basis, taking human beings and their behavior as the given and analyzing other minds as logical constructions out of actual and possible behavior. In fact, Carnap claim, claimed there is no practical difference between them. It's noteworthy that Carnap was mistaken in thinking that there could be a sense datum language at all. Sense datum language is essentially parasitic on material object language. All our talk of subjective appearances presupposes a material object language on pain of commitment to a private language. Of course, in his masterwork, The Philosophical Investigation, Wittgenstein showed this to be incoherent, for not only would it be unintelligible to others, it would be unintelligible to the speaker himself. Furthermore, if other people's joys and sufferings are merely logical constructions, it's difficult to see one should, why one should be in the slightest concerned about them just as there was no reason to be concerned about the apparent sufferings of animals according to Cartesian doctrine, since animals are just automata. It was disingenuous of Carnap to respond to this criticism by saying that this emoting was irrelevant to the logical constructionist enterprise of unified science. I'm going, because of reasons of time, to skip a moderately long section about the plight of neuroscientists, which is even worse than that of philosophers. I'm afraid I can't spend the time on that. It should be clear that the fragmentary tale I've sketched betokens something profoundly awry about the whole, tra whole tradition of early modern and modern philosophical discussion 
of the existence of other sentient beings and of the knowledge of the character of their experiences. Viewed from a distance, it seems incredible that the cream of European philosophers, men of outstanding intellectual powers, should write such nonsense. This is truly amazing. When we turn to survey the endeavours of neuroscientists and psychologists, even greater nonsense comes into view. Now, how can this be? It is, if, it is as if the portals of the metaphysics of mind exercise magic. Those who pass through them lose their grip on reality and on their mastery of language. The following remarks belong to the dialectic of other minds, an investigation into the logic of illusion. I've limited them to the philosophical tradition. Philosophers' confusions have the merit of being clear confusions through which we can learn. Neuroscientific and psychological confusions are more akin to Gordian knots that are just too entangled to unravel. It should be evident that one source of deep confusion is the persistent employment of the expression mind, coupled with a radical disagreement about what the expression means and disregard of how it is used. Descartes thought that the mind is an immaterial substance causally associated with a human org organism, but capable of independent existence. Berkeley thought the mind was an active principle altogether different from ideas that are passive, we know what the word mind means since we have a notion of it, but Berkeley did not explain what a notion is. Mill thought that a mind is a collection of actual and possible sense data, blithely and blindly assuming that it makes sense to speak of the actuality of possibilities, i.e. that it's possible for a subject to do or undergo something, irrespective of Mill's own denial that there are any subjects, and so on. They felt compelled to answer the question, what is a mind? It never occurred to them to drop the question. The fact that their predecessors had struggled with the question for centuries drove them to continue the struggle. To do otherwise would appear to be intellectual cowardice. But the question is a hopeless one. It would be far more fruitful to investigate what has to be true of a creature for us to say of it that it has a mind. After all, we don't say it of sticks and stones, nor of plants and trees. We say that a creature has a mind on the grounds of what it can do. And we determine what a, what a creature can do, not by hypothesizing what goes on in a spiritual substance, but by observing what it does in the circumstances <clears throat> of life. This line of thought leads directly to an even more radical one. The dead weight of the mind can be eliminated by putting it down. The sensible question isn't, are there other minds? One may ask whether there are other people, other human beings. But this question borders on the risable, since of course there are other human beings, far too many of them for the earth to sustain. Is there any intelligible reason for thinking them all to be zombies? And if oneself is the only human being alive? No, it's not an intelligible supposition of, or hypothesis. Their humanity is the bedrock upon which we stand as we acquire our concepts of thought and feeling, of perception and will. And if, heaven forfend, that bedrock moves, we are catastrophically damaged unto the seventh generation. How do we know what experiences other people are enjoying or suffering? What thoughts they are thinking, what feelings they're having and what they want or intend? These philosophical questions are not to be handled by trying to investigate immaterial substances, but by investigating what people do and say in the circumstances of life. Are there any reasons for skepticism here? Might they not all be pretending? No. There are many things that could not in principle be pretense such as screaming in agony when sorely injured. Actors making films pretend to hit each other, but if one of them breaks the jaw of the other, that's not pretense anymore. Pretense has to be learnt, so the cries of the neonate could not be pretense. It hasn't yet learned to pretend. And even when pretense is a logical possibility, successful pretense is pretty difficult. Few of us have the skills of Felix Krull, the Thomas Mann's confidence trickster. 
What led all these distinguished philosophers into such egregious error? One major factor was not so much confusions concerning knowledge of others, but rather confusions about oneself. There was, as far as I know, not a single philosopher from Descartes until Wittgenstein who did not insist that human beings know the contents of their consciousness, know what experiences they are having, what thoughts they are thinking, what feelings they are enjoying, and what desires and intentions beset them. If they know, then there must surely be an answer to the question of how they know. The thought was irresistible. Human beings, it was held, are self-conscious beings. They know the contents of their consciousness directly or immediately. How? Well, by being conscious of them, Descartes insisted. The contents of consciousness, he held, are indubitable, infallible, and certain. By perceiving them, Locke averred. And how can one perceive one's perceptions? By inner sense, which is just like outer sense, only without any sense organ. By apperception, Leibniz insisted. And by introspection, William James was much later to suggest, in 1890, which, he explained, is looking into one's mind and reporting there what we discover. To be sure, with these preconceptions, the problem of other minds was inevitable. For however we know what others are experiencing, thinking, feeling, or thinking or feeling, it is certainly not by consciousness, introspection, perception, apperception, or introspection. I can't be conscious of your consciousness in the relevant sense. I can't introspect your mind. I can't perceive your perceptions. And now we do indeed have a burning problem. Might other people not be zombies? How can I be sure that there are other minds at all? Moreover, the certainty, indubitability, and infallibility that allegedly characterizes self-knowledge is patently absent in the case of our knowledge of other minds, if we have any such knowledge. Can we know what others are experiencing? The argument from monology suddenly seems immensely appealing. So what has gone wrong? Not one thing, but many. All deep philosophical errors rest on a whole battery of mutually supporting incoherences. That's why demolishing one typically makes no, so little impact. I'll try to elaborate some of the deep confusions. First, there's a misconception about self-knowledge and self-consciousness. There is such a thing as self-knowledge, but little Tommy doesn't exhibit any when he announces, Mummy, I want a banana. Self-knowledge is hard to come by, is gained by reflection on one's character, emotions, actions and thoughts, and is endangered by our persistent tendency to self-deception. We are indeed self-conscious creatures, and that in more senses than one. But little Tommy is not on the path to self-consciousness in any of its senses when he cries out, Mommy, I've got a tummy ache. Second, there is no such thing as perceiving one's perceptions. One may see an object, event or process, and one may observe a state of affairs but there's no such thing as my seeing, my seeing, or perceiving, my observing. One's seeing or hearing don't take place in one's mind, but indoors or outdoors. Others may see me looking or observing something, but when I see something or look at and watch something or observe something, I don't see my seeing, looking, or watching, and I don't observe my observing. The first person present tense utterance, I see, or I can see, the aurora borealis, or I heard a noise in the bushes over there, do not rest on my seeing my seeing or perceiving my hearing. They are utterances or reports of my exercise of my sense faculties. The question, how do you know that you're seeing the aurora borealis, is misplaced, for there's no such thing as confusing seeing with hearing, and no such thing as hearing the aurora borealis. So the only sense that can be assigned to the question is, how do you know that what you see is the aurora borealis? to which there's an obvious answer. Namely, I'm looking at the northern lights flickering in the sky. Third, there is indeed such a thing as introspection, but contrary to James, it's not looking into one's mind. There's no such thing as looking into one's mind, or even as looking into the mind of another. Introspection is a form of self-reflection, not a form of perception. It involves reflecting on one's actions and character traits, on one's springs of action, likes and dislikes. 
Introverts are more prone to indulge in it than extroverts. It's a route to self-knowledge, but also a high road to self-deception. Our ability to say how things are with us does not rest on introspection, perception of perceptions, or apperception. Fourth, there are misconceptions concerning the knowledge, certainty, and indubitability of the mental. A, it was tempting to suppose that when one is in pain, one knows and is certain that one is, and one cannot doubt that one is. But this is wrong. When one is in pain, one cannot doubt whether one is in pain. There is no such thing as being in doubt, as, as being in pain and doubting whether one is. Doubt is logically, grammatically, or conceptually excluded. But by the very exclusion of doubt, certainty too is excluded. For if doubt is excluded by grammar, then there's nothing for certainty to exclude, and its predication is senseless. By the same token, it's mistaken to suppose that one knows one is in pain in the sense in which one may know that another is in pain. For there's no such thing as being in pain and being ignorant that one is in pain. And if so, there's no such, being in, no such thing as being in pain and knowing that one is. The logical exclusion of ignorance also excludes knowledge. Of course, there are legitimate use of I know I'm in pain, for example, concessive ones. But none of these are claims to knowledge akin to I know she is in pain. The concessive use amounts to, for example, I am indeed in pain, but I don't want to take an analgesic. Or, yes, I am in pain, but you need not keep on telling me. And you might say these are not genuine epistemic uses at all. Fifth, it was mistaken to suppose that it's characteristic of psychological attributes that they are transparent to their subject. Consciousness, introspection, perception or apperception were held to be the basis of our knowledge of the contents of our own mind. Now, it is true that a subclass of psychological attributes is immune to doubt. However, this is not the defining feature of the mental. It's correct that the sentence, I may be in pain or I may not be in pain, I don't know which is right, is an incoherent string of words with no use. If anybody were to say it, we'd, say, we'd ask him, what on earth do you mean? Similarly, I don't know whether I'm in agony or not is an unintelligible string of words. But I don't know whether I understand such and such, and I don't know whether I know the answer to such and such are perfectly in order and common. The subclass of indubitabilia is restricted to those cases where truthfulness guarantees truth. This excludes attributes that are or are akin to powers and abilities such as knowledge, memory, and understanding. But these two are surely psychological or mental attributes. This consideration brings us to the heart of the matter. It was an error to suppose that we know how things are with us by means of inner sense. It was a conceptual confusion to think that I can see whatever passes in my mind, and that is why I can say how things are with me. To use the Kantian idiom, I can see does not accompany all my representations, nor must it be able to accompany all my representations. Rather, I can say must be able to accompany all my representations. But how can that be? What grounds are there for my being able to say what I experience, feel, think or desire if I don't perceive, apperceive, or introspect the contents of my mind or the contents of consciousness? None. Those of my utterances that are such that truthfulness guarantees truth have no grounds whatsoever. But how is that possible? How can one rightly say that one is in pain, that one sees or hears something, that one thinks that things are thus and so, or that one intends to do such and such without any grounds? Is this not sheer dogmatism? No. It is an intrinsic feature of those concepts that they are Janus-faced, that one can, be one can be said to possess them only if one has mastered the grounds for applying them to others and can apply them groundlessly to oneself. 
We teach children the use of the psychological vocabulary in this domain by getting them to apply it to others on the grounds of behavioral criteria and getting them to use these expressions groundlessly in first-person avowals and manifestations of experience. An avowal of pain or of intention, of thought or imagination, no more needs grounds than a groan of pain or trying to get something needs grounds. Mastery of first and third person uses are two sides of one and the same coin. They cannot be prized apart. One cannot be said to possess the relevant psychological concept unless one has mastered both groundless first and grounded third person uses. So, there never was good reason for thinking that maybe there are no other people or that the existence of other people was doubtful. Similarly, there never was good reason for thinking that we can only achieve belief or opinion regarding the thoughts, experiences and desires of others. We very often do know that someone else is in pain or is conscious, is thinking of this or that and intends to do such and such. We succumb all too often to a particular picture of the mental the inner outer picture of the mind and behavior. We are prone to think that we perceive only the outer, the mere behavior, whereas the subject himself sees the inner by apperception or introspection. But this picture is profoundly misleading. We altogether forget that people's thoughts and feelings, their intentions and purposes may be brilliantly and perspicuously represented on the stage. When someone pours out their heart to us, we don't feel that their words, the expressions on their face, their gestures and posture, their passionate trembling or broken tones of voice are merely the outer, that their inner is still hidden from us. It's only when we cannot read their behavior and expression that we're tempted to think that there is a hidden inner. <clears throat> the whole picture of inner and outer needs to be rejected. The misconceived debate about other minds that has persisted throughout the modern era has masked some very important feature of our circumstances among our fellow human beings. We are not transparent to others. We often do not know what another person is thinking. People commonly do not show their feelings but suppress them. They don't always tell us what they intend to do but keep their plans to themselves. Now these are cases of ignorance of others. Quite apart from such cases of ignorance are cases of deceit, which induce false beliefs. Sometimes other people dissimulate, and we are very often taken in by their deceptive behavior, falling victim to the confidence trickster, the femme fatale, or the deceitful politician. Such cases of ignorance and deception must be distinguished from the manifold cases of indeterminacy. We commonly don't know what others are thinking, but it's not as if they're always clear themselves. Although it's true that we often cannot say what another person thinks, this need not be by contrast with him. It's often by contrast with people with whom I readily find my way about and whose responses and reactions I can often anticipate. For to be sure, one often doesn't know what one thinks on a given matter. But that's not typically because one thinks one thing and doesn't realize that one does, or refuses to admit even to oneself that one does. Those would be cases of self-deception. Notice a striking asymmetry between the first and third person utterances. I don't know what Jill thinks about Jack is an admission of ignorance, but I don't know what I think about Jack is not a confession of ignorance, but lack of adequate reflection on the issue at hand. If I don't know what I think about someone or something, what I need is not an internal monitor that will disclose my thoughts, but more facts about the issue at hand that will enable me to make up my mind. Similarly, we commonly don't know what another person is going to do, but our ignorance is not to be contrasted with their certitude. Again, notice the striking asymmetry between the first and third person utterances. I don't know what I'm going to do is not a confession of ignorance, but of indecision. What the agent needs is not knowledge of his own intentions, but decision. And of course, we may realize the indecision of another. 
The difficulty in understanding others is not always because they keep their thoughts, feelings, wishes and intentions to themselves. Often their thoughts and feelings are inchoate and undetermined. They may be insufficient there to grasp. Our difficulties in understanding others may be mirrored in their difficulties in understanding and explaining themselves. Furthermore, we often can't understand others even though they're trying their very best to explain themselves to us. Commonly, we can't grasp how such and such a consideration could count as a reason for another to think, feel or do something. Practical reason is underdetermined by the facts and what counts as a reason for one person may not be intelligible as such for another. Human behavior is a bewildering admixture of the predictable and unpredictable. Social life would be quite impossible if there weren't a high degree of predictability in social behavior. Society is held together by manifold norms of conduct that are generally abided by. Some are legal, some are moral, and some are what used to be called small morals, held in place by the fact that non-compliance is just not the done thing. We can be quite sure, for example, that other people will not suddenly strip naked and walk on all fours. However, only change the circumstances, as in war or comparable breakdown of civil society, and human beings are likely to be unpredictable in their savagery and their brutality. On the other hand, even in the circumstances of a well-ordered peaceful society, it's characteristic for human beings that they're not predictable, either in the large or in the small. We simply don't know enough about each other to be able to predict each other's reactions and behavior in the indefinite variety of circumstances of life that are themselves unpredictable. By and large, we know more about Anna Karenina, Madame Bovary or Isabel Archer than we do about our spouse. We are at best translucent, not transparent, and we are often quite opaque. Private history is as unpredictable as public history. This unpredictability rests partly on ignorance, partly on intrinsic indeterminacy. The intrinsic indeterminacy is not only due to the fact that human beings are themselves unclear about their own thoughts, feelings and intentions, but also to the indeterminacy of motivation. I must tell you that these remarks are wholly dependent upon a brilliant discussion of this issue by Georg Henrik von Wright in his Tanner Lectures. Often there are many different reasons for acting in a certain way. Reasons of self-interest, perhaps of reward or favourable public recognition, jostle with moral reasons. Moral reasons mingle with reasons pertaining to what others would say or think if one were not to act. Desire and attitude, likes and dislikes, force themselves upon our attention. This variety may conflict. Some furnishing reasons for doing, others furnishing reasons for abstaining. In such cases, a decision is needed. But in other cases, this plenitude of reasons may all speak in one voice, in which case the agent will typically act accordingly. But for what, for what reason did he act? Supposing he did the morally right thing, did he act for the moral reason, or did he act because it was in his interest, or because he was afraid of the acrimony that would accrue if he did otherwise? Can he say what reason moved him? Can we? Our judgment will be based on our acquaintance with the agent's character and personality, on our knowledge of his past behavior and behavior patterns. However, his avowal that he acted for such and such a reason has no such grounds. What makes a reason, a given reason, a person's reason for acting, thinking or feeling? Not its causal powers, since reasons have no causal powers. They are warrants, not causes. It is the acting agent with the capacity for rationality that makes a reason his reason. He does so by accepting responsibility of what he did as done for that reason. 
It is the agent's understanding that makes the connection between reason and acting. Does he enjoy privileged authority in the matter? Is his sincere word final? No, he may be deceiving himself, or he may be unsure, not knowing how to interpret his own deed. In some cases, someone else who knows him well, his spouse perhaps, may insist that he didn't actually act for the reason he avows. The agent may then come to see his own action in a new light, make a connection that was not there before, and this may transform his subsequent conducts, but he may not. All the facts of the case may be agreed, and yet disagreement may persist, for there may be more than one legitimate way of viewing or ordering the facts of the case. In this sense, there is a radical indeterminacy in human thought, feeling, and action. And herein lies the potentiality for tragic failures of mutual understanding between human beings. Here, love may turn into hate, friendship into bitter animosity. And this is a feature of the human condition. Thank you. extremely stimulating uh, lecture, a lot to think about there. Um, so uh, we have time for some Q&A. Um, I think I'm just <laughs> going to proceed on the basis of uh, seeing which hand I see first and, and, and trying to make a list. If I, if I get uh, the order wrong, just you know, apologies, but, but I'll try and, uh, try and be fair. So um, if anyone would like to raise a question, I first hand I can see is over there, gentlemen there. Thank you. Oh, how frightening. Um, okay, uh, Professor Hacker, firstly, it's a huge honor to see you live and in the flesh. Um, I'm a huge admirer of your works, and uh, actually, they were the foundation of my PhD, so thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, I, I don't have, uh, I think, I'm struggling with articulating this properly, but I will try. Um, so, if, so my concern is with pre linguistic concepts, whether that is even coherent, whether that can be a thing. So is it possible, do you think, for example, if a baby um, burns himself on, um, on, on a flame, uh, that he can learn about pain and understand pain without actually knowing about where this concept operates in a whole schema, you know, whether there is some kind of embodied knowledge that basically is evident there, something that's more animalistic, something that's closer to sort of animal um, understanding, whether, we, whether there is any sense in using concepts in that sense, or whether it needs to be carved up totally separately to, you know, a human conceptual world. It, um, it seems to me um, that the child is in exactly the same position as the cat or the dog. Uh, it responds in a violent way, withdraws its hand and screams. Um, um, There's no need to invoke the notion of concept and concept possession. That is, it seems to me you can describe what's going on without invoking that at all. Um, and you must ask yourself, why do, we, why do we need the concept of a concept? After all, between about, uh, what, uh, 1600 and 1750 or later, 1770, the term idea was used promiscuously all over the place, caused absolute havoc, and we owe it to Kant to have introduced the notion of concept to replace the notion of idea. And that was a tremendous advance. It at least cleared a lot of difficulties out of the way. It's useful to talk about concepts because we want to abstract from talk about individual words in individual languages. We want to talk about the commonalities between different languages. And so the notion of concept is a useful way of abstracting from the use of words in a given language to, to talk about commonalities. So it's true that the German Ursache is not used exactly the same as the English word cause. You'll find some differences. None of them are very important. Right? So we can abstract from the English or German and just talk about the, the concept of causation. Um, and it's very useful too. So. If you want to ascribe concepts to a being, you have to ask what, what are the circumstances under which it's correct to attribute the notion of a concept to the creature. 
And surely the answer has to be, well, if it's mastered the use of a word which expresses <coughs> that concept, and this babies haven't done and animals haven't done. So what possible benefit can accrue by invoking some stranger notion of a concept than the one I've just sketched uh, in the context of the baby? And I myself can't see any. Yeah, I suppose I'm trying to um, grasp with um, uh, the, uh, the life of, um, you know, uh, non-conceptual, you know, beings like animals and mm -hmm. toddlers and things. I'm trying to understand what's going on there, I'm trying to understand, you know, um, to some degree their inner life and how they relate to one another, their emotions and everything else other outside of behavior. And I'm just mm -hmm. trying to sort of grasp, you know, is there a... Is there a role for pre-linguistic conceptual again, possession? I think, I think, know, it, I think it, the it answer... It sounds coherent, I know. And I, I think <laughs> I'm just trying to stretch it a little bit, you know. But. I think the answer is no. I mean, yeah. there has been some talk by some philosophers, including philosophers who I have great respect, of proto-concepts. I don't see any merit to it. Yeah. Um, animals... Animals don't have an autobiography. They don't even have a biography. Uh, they don't live in time in the sense in which human beings do. They live in the <coughs> perpetual present. One of the most striking features, if you watch nature films, as most of us do, if you, watch, if you see a lion take a zebra in a herd, because the whole herd runs for its life, the lion catches a weaker member of the herd, kills it. Ten minutes later, the herd are peacefully munching away at grass while the lion is eating the flesh of the dead peer. So, do you want to say, uh, well, I'm not sure what you want to say, but the <laughs> simple fact is that the thought, one of our group was killed by a lion ten minutes ago, is not a possible thought for an animal that hasn't mastered a tense language with possibility of temporal reference. Uh, as soon as the adrenaline is cleared out of the system, they're perfectly quiet, quiet and there is no noticeable, so no past that they can conjure before their minds because they don't actually have a mind. That is, the ascription of minds to animals seems to me to be a dire mistake. They are sensitive creatures, they're intelligent creatures, they have very, some of them have very strong associative powers. Um, they can remember, they have WH memory, they can remember where, how, who, what, when, uh, but they don't have the capacity for memory of facts, memory that things are thus and worth thus and so, and so forth. So I can't see any profit, intellectual enlightenment in, in, could, can ensue from stretching up the concept of a concept in the way that you're suggesting. <coughs> um, thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. That was a great talk. I enjoyed it. I'm just wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about why we shouldn't think of reasons as causes. So, uh, well, because reasons are warrants and causes are not warrants. A reason is a justification. A cause is not a justification. Um, I mean, that's the short answer. I don't know if that helps you. Um, uh, I mean, one reason why it makes no sense to ascribe to animals, or for that matter to machines, including computers, the possibility of drawing inferences. It's because to draw an in, or, or to apprehend an inference, to draw an inference is to apprehend a warrant in the relation between two sets of propositions, or a set of premises and a conclusion. The premises warrant the conclusion. Apprehending of that is not a process. It's something you have to apprehend, and you can only apprehend that if you have some conception of what it is to justify. And that neither machines nor animals have, or could have. So, so if I was thinking about the difference between uh, <coughs> a habitual behaviour and a kind of decision-made behaviour... And so it was... A habitual behaviour and then one that's non-habitual, oh, so where yes. I actually decide okay. to yes. do something. Right. One line you might have is the difference is that there's no reason playing a role in the habitual case. But no, uh... no, that's wrong. Um, look, I brush my teeth every morning. It's a habit of mine, I'm sure, of everybody here. I have jolly good reasons for brushing my teeth, but it's still habitual behaviour. Um, 
Uh, behavior done for reasons doesn't even require any antecedent event. I'm walking down the streets with you. You slip on a banana skin. I catch you. Intuitive death, a spontaneous reaction. Did I not have a reason for catching you? Well, you can argue. Well, of course I had a reason. You were going to fall. And otherwise I wouldn't have stretched out to catch you. So the reason may be given ex post acto. It doesn't have to be something that crossed your mind antecedent into action. Right? And that, I suggest to you, is how we use the term reason. It's a very important feature of reasons. Uh, uh, that we cite them as justification, sometimes in advance of action, and when we mull over the reason, when we think about the reason, when we, so to speak, speak, bear it in mind for what we're going to do tomorrow, next week, or next year, that's one thing we can do. Or we may act on the reason here and now without reflecting on it at all, and sometimes we may only come up with it afterwards, but it is still the reason for which we did what we did. <laughs> well, by all means, go on, no, no, come. come. But, so yes. we have a difference between uh, correct citing of a reason and a kind of confabulation. So sometimes, uh, oh, certainly. and I wonder how if, if reasons aren't playing any kind of causal role, you get that difference because they might still be warranting oh. reasons. Oh, uh, I, I mean, um, we we have cases of confabulation where somebody says that somebody was his reason, and somebody who knows him well says that he was just lying. Mm. Most of our, one of our late prime ministers was very, very good at that. Uh, so it didn't need a great deal of wit to see that such and such was not his reason at all, although he avowed that it was. So we can lie about our reasons. More problematically, we can deceive ourselves about reasons, and that is more problematic, and I touched on that at the end of the paper. Um, but I don't think there's any great difficulty about uh, avowing reasons when they aren't the real reasons, or being or, or deceiving oneself. I think all these can be co uh, account accounted for perspicuously without involving the notion of causal powers. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, <coughs> right. no, thank you very much, Peter. I thought the brilliant magisterial analysis of the errors, particularly in the early modern period. Uh, oh, thank you, John. Which um, classic case of philosophers raising the dust and then complaining. <laughs> They yes. can't see. But supposing we ditch all that stuff, we ditch Cartesian mental substances, we abandon the veil of ideas, and we go back to something like, which I think is your view, a kind of common sense Aristotelian, we are human beings, we're members of a certain species, the human species, yes. and we have certain powers and capacities. Um, we have mental attributes and we have physical attributes. That's all relatively uncontroversial. And it, yes. Um, but now, there's still a very familiar challenge uh, in modern, in contemporary philosophy, our contemporary philosophy. Mm -hmm. I guess, of course, very well known to you, running from Nagel through to David Chalmers, which says that even when I know all your capacities and your powers, even, though, even, even when I know everything you do, and everything you say, and will add in stuff about how your brain is operating. There's still some aspect which is a which is hidden from me, namely what it's like to be you, what it what what it feels mm. like when you sip your wine and or you smell mm. the coffee, the whole qualia, problem, yes. which you didn't explicitly address. But I wondered if the materials you did lay out provide a, a response to that? Well, um, the answer is, it, the short answer is no. Um, I've discussed consciousness and the illusions of uh, the what is likeness of experience, as some of the Americans hideously refer to this, uh, at great length elsewhere. Um, that is, I think the... Tom Nagel wrote that hugely influential article in the 1970s, if I remember correctly, um, in response to formalism, to um, functionalism in, in philosophy of psychology. Because functionalism seemed to introduce a, a black box as a mind, but somehow the lost our humanity. We were just machines with a Turing, a Turing machine in the middle with inputs and outputs. And, you know, 
so Tom Nagel thought in order to restore our humanity, you'd introduce something that's terribly missing in the functionist account, namely what it feels like to feel uh, what it feels like to be me, what it feels like to feels like to have the experiences that I feel. Actually, what he should have done is just to show what ridiculous nonsense functionalism was in the first place. I mean, functionalism was introduced partly as a result of infatuation with the Turing machines and partly as a response to behaviorism. It was altogether the wrong response to behaviorism. There are lots and lots of, well, there's some things right about behaviorism and many more things wrong about behaviorism, but functionalism doesn't point them out and doesn't remedy them. So, as it were, I think that Nagel's move was the wrong move. He was trying to remedy the wrong thing. What he should have remedied was the temptation to functionalism. So he invoked the idea that uh, there is something which it is like to experience this, that, or the other, and there's something which it is like to be me, and something which it is like to be a bat, which is incommunicable, and only the bat knows what it's like. Now, I'm not sure I can now reconstruct the rather detailed argument that I originally gave, but um, I did argue in about three or four different places that the actual, the actual sentence, um, there is something which it is like to be me, there is something which it is like to experience as a, despite the fact that it looks impeccable, is actually not English. It's Californian. <laughs> um, that is, um, I can ask the question, you know, what was it like to be, is it to break your leg? And you might say it was bloody awful, excruciatingly painful. Now, if you want to engage, not quite clear to me why you should want to engage, if you want to engage in second level quantification, you can say, um, what are you going to say? There was something which it was like to break my leg, namely awful, or there was something which it was to break my leg, namely bloody awful. And it's the latter that is the correct second level quantification. And the term like got itself smuggled in there illicitly. Because you can't generalize saying, well, what... Um, what was it like to break your leg? It was like awful. That's what you say in California, but not, I hope, elsewhere. Right? In California, everything is like whatever. Right? But the correct generalization is there was something which it was. So I, I've tried to pack together which, what, something that takes me about 10 or 15 pages to elaborate in detail, but generally, I think that whole movement made by Tom Nagel, which was so colossally influential and pernicious, uh, and led us down the garden path for the best part of 50 years, is, is, is deeply, deeply misguided. But it, just to come out very briefly, it seems to me it doesn't have to be expressed in terms of the what it is like phrase. Mm -hmm. the, the underlying problem could be thought to be that we can see the world in two ways, either as animals moving around, doing certain things, saying mm -hmm. certain things, or as subjects of mm. experience. And it's not clear how the, that second dimension oh, uh, that, is, that, is yes. revealed in the operations of the yes. organism. No, 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 wait, I, I, I couldn't agree more, John. Um, what's terrifying about us as a species is that we slip so easily from the one to the other. In our normal human relations, for the most part, most of us, we see each other as other human beings with their own feelings, their own sensitivities and sensibilities, their own peculiarities, their own visions. And we, in the case of close friends and, and, and spouses, uh, we do our very best to take all these features into account. And, and that is part of the struggle to live to be a decent human being. But it's so easy for us to abandon that, as we can see at the moment in Ukraine, or as you could see right throughout the Second World War, or as you can see, I mean, in hundreds of different places. And the really terrifying thing to me, and I'm getting awfully old, 
that really terrify is how easy it is, how widespread it is, and we never learn. That's the terrible thing. I mean, there were many people after the Second World War, alert after the war to the appalling slaughter which the internments inflicted on, on Jews, on gypsies, on homosexuals, on Russian, God knows, anyway. And they set up the United Nations and, and they introduced crimes of genocide and crimes against humanity into international law, which all looked very promising. And it looked as if, for a while, that humanity might have learned a lesson and might be able to say never again. But what we've learned in the intervening 70 years is just not true. We don't learn and we go ahead and do it again and again and again. And I have no answer to this horror. No answer at all. So, before moving on to the next, uh, I can't, can't resist speaking. <coughs> the, the lecturer who introduced me to Descartes many, many years ago told a story of how he was giving a lecture uh, in the USA. I don't know if it was California, I can't <laughs> remember, but it was definitely in the USA and uh, mentioned uh, trying to put forward Descartes' causal principle that like effects have like causes, to which a student put up that. Professor, of course, like effects, like, you know, like causes. <laughs> they got nowhere. <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. Okay. Yes, um, I would like to, to hear what you have to say about two, two positions that are share a lot of the same piece of positions as solipsism and that can be found in early modern philosophy and also en vogue today. So the one is panpsychism, and the other is uh, connected with artificial intelligence. It's the idea that it's only a matter of time until computers are just as much or more intelligent than we are. So where, if, if they do, do these positions also go wrong? Well, each one of those merits a lecture. Um, so I can, it's not, it's, I can say a little bit, but not a lot that just isn't rude. Um, um, I mean, when it comes to artificial intelligence, I think what you need to ask yourself is whether these machines that we, we, we build machines to do tasks which we do with intelligence, and we build them because they may do the same tasks faster, or they may be able to do tasks which we can't do, but which we can envisage and envisage machines as doing, which is fine. But it doesn't follow that the machines are intelligent. It's, it's artificial intelligence. Just as in Monopoly, you have artificial money. It's not real money. Uh, why is it artificial intelligence? Well, because they're not living creatures. Uh, I think intelligence is a phenomenon of, of life, not just human life, of course. Uh, and what produces intelligence is, is confrontation with, with problems in the, in the environment and the given nature of the animal in question. Animals who, uh, to survive, have to be able to react to circumstances in a, in a way that will preserve the species and preserve their offspring. Um, if, if I, I think I wrote somewhere that the, the roots of thought are not computational power, but suffering and frustration of desire. Um, you, you talked about emotions. Well, machines can't feel emotions, and the can't, there's a logical can't. Not as, it's not just they don't. So there's no such thing as a machine feeling an emotion. You say, well, why can't you make one? Well, when you can make machines that can care about something, I'll listen to you seriously. But the root of the notion of an emotion and what collects them, all the notions of emotion together is the capacity to care. And that's a capacity which animals have and in particular human beings normally have. And it's only highly abnormal human children are born with either diminished or non-existent capacity for care and they're damaged human beings. So that's as far as artificial intelligence, well, very briefly. Uh, and, we're not going to make creatures more intelligent than us because we can't make creatures that are intelligent. We can make creatures that can do infinite damage to us and give infinite powers to governments, the result of which will be catastrophic. And they might even run out of control. 
All that's possible, and some of the science fiction re written is perfectly reasonable. These are things that could happen, God help us. But it still wouldn't show that there's any intelligence at work there. What was the second question you asked? About uh, panpsychism. Oh, panpsychism. Good <coughs> lord. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 yes, I, I, um, It's unintelligible nonsense, but I, 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 won't, I, I won't try to answer it. I, I mean, one would have to go down to discussing the, the kinds of criteria that we invoke in order to <coughs> characterise living beings, beings with any kind of sensibility, beings who respond to their environment uh, in the variety of ways in which living creatures do, and sticks and stones don't. And not only they don't, it's, it's, they wouldn't be sticks and stones if, uh, I mean, you can have Walt Disney films where the, you know, the stick gets up and it grows a couple of arms and legs and goes twaddling. Well, you can do that. We, can, we, we enjoy imagining nonsense and some of the fairy tales we tell and the films we make are based on the nonsense because it's rather fun. But don't for heaven's sake think that it makes sense. There's no reason why you shouldn't enjoy certain kinds of nonsense outside philosophy. So, yeah, gentlemen, thank you. In one of your recent books, uh, *The Moral Powers*, you thought to uh, you thought to give us a overview of various moral concepts and whatnot. <coughs> uh, in an early part of the book, it may be actually at the very start, you explain that uh, value is something that uh, we can only make sense of uh, in reference to life. Yes. Uh, in a, I believe you say something to the effect that uh, in a universe without life, there is no value. That's right. Right. Uh, a part of that book, you uh, give an overview of uh, various kinds of goodness. You uh, mentioned that you're indebted to your, uh, Henry von Bright and that. Uh, and I can accept that. Uh, for most of these, uh, or for those goodness you bring up, the, uh, what you said is uh, correct. I can imagine that hedonic goodness isn't really going to exist in a universe where no one feels anything, or that uh, instrumental goodness can't exist in a universe where no one is making instruments. I can even accept that perhaps for uh, moral goodness, for if there are no uh, exchanges between living beings, it doesn't seem to be uh, much possibility for morality at all. But I'm having some issue with uh, artistic goodness, one might say. We can imagine a future where, the, uh, where humanity has died out, or perhaps all life on Earth has died out, but some of the great works of literature and art and whatnot has survived uh, in some form or uh, of another books laying around in libraries that are not used anymore. And I'm having issue uh, reconciling the idea that one might say that those great works will no longer be good or great artistically uh, because humanity is gone. Uh, can you help shed some light on this well, issue? I, I'm not at all sure, but I'll try. Um, I mean, here, here you have cases in, in which things have great aesthetic value, um, and sometimes profound aesthetic value, and you're envisaging humanity being wiped out, but some of the works remaining. And so we can say, we standing back contemplating the scene, so to speak, we're thinking about the scene here and now, about a certain possibility. We can say, these works were once appreciated by human beings and were valued in such and such ways. We certainly do that, we've just done it. Uh, that doesn't seem to be problematic. Um, so what exactly is value? How can they still have value when there's no one left to value them? It's more that um, since goodness would be a value, and I would imagine that artistic goodness is a value, then it, it, the issue seems to be that if we would say that, if someone told me, uh, the works of Shakespeare are artistically good, uh, great perhaps, 
if I responded to that, well, for now, but once humanity is gone, they will no longer be so. It, there's something disquieting about that response. Well, why do you need that particular form of description? Um, not just the form of description is causing you unease, and, and uh, um, why, wh what is wrong with saying, as I did say, uh, these great works of art, which are uh, beautiful or whatever epithet you wish to use, um, will remain long after human beings have, have vanished from the world because whatever. Um, you and you now raise, so they were valued by human beings, they are valued now by human beings, but when there are no human beings, there'll be no one to value them. Will they lose their value? Um, uh, obviously, that's the question that's tying you and me into not, in knots at the moment. And the question is, what's wrong with the question? How to sidestep the question while still doing justice to it? Um, I mean, the very, I mean, I, I, I'm making this up, <laughs> to forgive me, my really thoughts. Um, of course, you can, you can invoke various counterfactuals. If there were any human beings, they would greatly admire these works. Well, that's certainly true. Does that help? Uh, teeny bit. <laughs> I'm really not sure what to say, uh, except things I've already said. They were valued. There aren't any people left to value them. I mean, we, va we, we think of wonderful sunsets. We hugely admire wonderful sunsets. Almost everybody I've ever come across admires. Um, but there'll be wonderful sunsets in that same sense long after there are any human beings on this earth. Uh, will they... Will they be beautiful? So you have to ask yourself, well, what is the conceptual framework within which epithets like beauty have a role to play? Right? And aren't, isn't, aren't those preconditions, isn't that framework missing in the story you're telling? That is, it makes sense to talk about beauty and uh, profundity in the case of works of literature, say. It makes sense to invoke these within a framework in which there's a human community with a certain range of capacities, creative powers and, and abilities to appreciate. When you rip that framework apart, then you're just left with the naked epithets. And arguably that it no longer makes much sense, perhaps makes no sense. So that's another line that you might pursue. I, mean, I haven't tried it out, but it's something that one might pursue. Um, I, I have one of my favorite paintings is, is uh, Raphael's Donna Velata. It seems to me to be a painting that <coughs> radiates tender love. Tender love on behalf of the painter and tender love on behalf of the lady painted. And I should hope that any sensitive person who looks at that painting will feel the same. And now I suppose humanity is destroyed. Does the patient still radiate tender love? I feel something's going wrong here. Something's going wrong here precisely because all the institutions and conventions, all the presuppositions of aesthetic appreciation, all have been wiped off the slate. And what sense is left in those circumstances to counterfactually invoke these conditions? And I'm not sure there is any. That's the best I can do. <laughs> So <clears throat> I have a question about the very end of the paper, um, yes. and, and it's not a, this is not a, a challenge, it's, yes. it's I really a question. So you were talking about the indeterminacy, yes. in the, um, and I take it you have, you sort of set up a scenario where you have an agent and an interpreter of the agent, yes. and the agent, you, I, I think you thought that the, the agent, it might be indeterminate um, what is, what the agent's reasons are. Yes. 
and the, the interpreter has to deal with this indeterminacy in the agent. Yes. But you also suggest that the agent ha might have to deal with this indeterminacy in yes. the agent. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and this might lead to all sorts of tragic situations. Mm. Yeah, that, yes. That, that's right. Yes. But you, I just was hoping you'd say a little bit more about it, because although you sort of sketched out that scheme, you didn't really give us an example. Yes. And so I thought perhaps if you gave us a kind of oh, example. Yes, I see. Yes, I, see. I mean, I, 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 sh I should say, I tried to interpolate whatever is there I've learned from von Wright, which I, I think is discussion of the issue at the end of his second time lectures on human nature is just brilliant. I don't, the only, <laughs> you know, one often has, at least I often have the experience as being as a student of Wittgenstein, you climb painfully up, and God, I mean, up a mountain, gasping, exhausted, you reach the top, there's a little notice saying Ludwig was here. <laughs> so, so, so Wittgenstein touches on this issue in the investigations. I mean, he, he's, he's, differentiates between somebody saying, um, I'm leaving the room because you told me to, and I'm leaving the room but not because you told me to. Right? Well, that is hinting at much the same sort of thing. Um, and you might say what von Wright has done is, is develop that tiny little seed further. Um, the kind of example you might, well, let me make one up. Um, uh, husband and wife go to a party. And there's a pleasant young lady there, and, and the husband engages in discussion with her, and jokes with her, perhaps spends a little more time with her than with others. And the wife castigates him when they're going home, and say, you were flirting with her. And he said, I wasn't flirting, I was just being pleasant. She's a nice young lady, I wasn't flirting. Yes, you were, and indeed you were lusting after her. Now, it's perfectly possible to envisage no disagreement about the raw data, so the facts of the case, of what actually was observed as mm. happening. But the two, the two partners are putting together the material in different ways, if you like. It's like a, a jigsaw puzzle that can be put together in two different ways. And it's then that tragedy can ensue, because there may be no further facts mm. of the matter which could settle the debate. Now, very often, von Wright does make this point, very often, you, you listen patiently to what the other persons are saying, and you, and you may come to an agreement. Mm. And, and you may say, yes, yes, you're right. I, I didn't really think that that was why I was doing it, but mm. you've persuaded me. Mm -hmm. So you might say that in that case, the, the interlocutor gets the subject to view the phenomena, view the behavior in a, in a new light. Mm -hmm. And it, the fact that he accepts it gives it validity. Mm -hmm. But then there may be tragic cases where neither will budge. And that's where, that, that's where potentiality for tragedy can occur. Um, and it may occur in friendships too, um, and be the source of, of a friendship being transformed into animosity. Mm -hmm. um, um, I don't, does that help? Well, I, I guess I, when I was, <laughs> What I was, um, I wasn't. What I wasn't sure whether there are cases where there we agree about the overt behavior, and the two parties are disagreeing about um, something beyond the overt behavior, namely the, the motivation or yes. right. Okay. Now, actually, the motivation can be indeterminate. Never mind the overt behavior. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. So. So, and we're familiar with that phenomenon. Yeah, of course, right. yes. And so then the question is, well, is there a correct answer about, or is the correct answer, well, it was indeterminate? Well, I, mean, I, I try to spread out the various possibilities yeah. here, and, and you're perfectly right. There may be cases where it's indeterminate, with, and indeed, it's not just they don't have the correct answer, there isn't a correct right. answer. Yeah. That's a possibility. Yeah. But then I was going on to the further case, which I characterize following von Wright, I think he says this, as, as a containing the potentiality of, of, of tragedy. Yeah, yeah. Where, where there isn't a, that kind of indeterminacy, but there are two different ways of looking at yeah, the yeah, same yeah. phenomena. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's a human possibility, yeah. and it is an intrinsically tragic one. That was all. Okay. But the other cases you have in mind are certainly much more common. Yeah. Much more common. Thank you. Um, if we could jump in with a quick question, and then we have think, maybe time for one more question uh, before we need to bring proceedings to a close. I'm intrigued by this, what you were saying about knowledge and ignorance, right? That, that, yes. um, and I think your, your position is 
a well a well kind of articulated over you know a long period of time this view that it doesn't make sense to say that you let's know that such and such unless it makes sense to say that you're ignorant yeah. of such and such so it doesn't yeah. make sense to know for me to know that i'm in pain unless it made sense for me to be ignorant that i'm in pain it doesn't seem to make sense yeah. but suppose you know we step outside the mind and think about something like my standing here well uh, does it make sense to say that I'm ignorant that there's a floor underneath me? I think it's stretching it to say that it makes sense. You'd have to cook up some pretty weird sort of mind-altering situation yes. so that it makes sense yes. for, for me to be ignorant that there's a floor underneath me. And yet I certainly know that there's a floor underneath yes. me and I base a lot of my daily actions on the assumption that I know that there's a floor yes. underneath me. What would you say about that? Well, it, it seems to me you're, you're, you're treading into the area of Wittgenstein's discussions in uncertainty in the, the last, uh, what is it, six or five notebooks yeah. that he wrote in his life. Yeah. Because um, I don't think they're altogether akin to the I'm in pain case or right. such like. Uh, it's rather they're, they're empirical propositions which are such that you can't abandon them. Right. Uh, that is, if, if, if you were to abandon them, then you would lose your sanity. I mean, you'd, you'd yeah. use, use a grip on the, on, the, on the whole structure of knowledge and belief that you have about the world you live in and about yourself in it. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if I tell you, you know, you, you, your name isn't really David, and you're not really a philosopher at all, and you know, you've never been on the faculty of reading, you know, well, you, if, if there were any truth in what I say, you'd make a beeline for the nearest lunatic asylum, so to speak. Um, I mean, these are not propositions, although they're empirical propositions, they're not propositions the negation of which is intelligible within the framework of your thought. Or, or, now, some of them are within the framework of our thought in general, and some of them are highly personal. So, I mean, in the case of most of us, you know, our own proper name or our own career. Uh, but in other cases, you know, birds, do, what is it, uh, cats don't grow on trees and, and, uh, and so forth and so on. So the reason why the topic interested Wittgenstein so much, I think, or one reason, uh, was that they have some similarities to empirical propositions. They are empirical propositions, they have some similarities to grammatical propositions. Uh, and yet they're not grammatical propositions. Um, and, I mean, he put his finger on something that really nobody had ever thought about before. And it's very interesting, but the work is totally undeveloped. I mean, these are the last scribbles of a dying man who couldn't stop thinking about philosophical issues, and they're inconsistent, and he tries one thing, tries another thing, comes back again. And whatever we make of those notes is up to us more than up to him. Sure. Okay, so we have time for one last question from Dominic. Back here. So it's just a small thing, it didn't come up in your talk, but it came up in various question, answers to questions. Uh, in a few answers, or in fact twice, you referred to animals as having intelligence. And I was wondering, uh, when you attribute animals having intelligence, are you attributing intelligence univocally between animals and human beings? And if you are, uh, in what sense is a human being different from an animal after all? What is it a power, and what is the name of that sure. Well, I, I mean, to put it very briefly and in a nutshell, I would associate intelligence with the uh, ability to resolve predicaments in life. And the animal, animals have that capacity no less than we do, and if they didn't, they wouldn't have survived. The problems they, they tackle are problems which occur within their particular form of life in the particular environments in which they live. Um, but they're not language users. And I wish to say that everything distinctive about us, that, well, sorry, everything interestingly distinctive about us, to be qualified more carefully, uh, uh, is attributable to the fact we're language users. I mean, Homo sapiens was a grotesque misnomer, but Homo loquens hits the nail on the head. We're talking animals. And the fact that we can talk and therefore can think and can reason and can act for reasons and have a capacity for rationality, all this flows from the fact that we've mastered a sophisticated language. If I may come back. Of course. Just quickly. Uh, so what 
you're attributing a lot to a language, but what, yes. un what sits underneath that expression, what's the power that sits underneath, as it were? Uh, I don't uh, understand you. What sits underneath? underneath yeah, so the... are you talk about, uh, you, you don't like the term homo sapien, but... I, so I don't like the term? Homo sapien. If, if I oh, so, well, no, I, uh, wisdom is a very, very rare commodity among human beings. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, it just remains uh, for me to thank Peter so much for, for coming to give us the second uh, lecture. Really appreciate a wonderful paper, great discussion, and thank you everyone for coming to give Peter a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.